Characters are a second category of major class of data encodings. Characters are what make up all of the words and text and strings and sentences and paragraphs and everything that you see that's digital on a computer that looks like text or strings in any way, those are characters. It's the, it's the, it's a, it's the second major class of data encoding that we'll talk about of the three. And this is very, very straightforward also. It's a lookup table. That's really all it is. It's a lookup table that maps a sequence of ones and zeros to a particular character. This particular table that I just put up is called the ASCII table. It's the most common, historical, at least most common, mapping of a sequence of ones and zeros to characters that were used. It was extremely popular earlier in computing. It's not so common now. It's been replaced by something called UTF-8. Oops. UTF-8, which is Unicode, which is something you might have heard of, but ASCII, uh, which is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, was the dominant character encoding scheme for decades up until up until UTF-8 came out and uh, basically it took over. Um, now UTF-8, believe it or not, is actually backwards compatible with ASCII for the first seven bits. Uh, and then it did changes a little bit um, later on, which is ASCII extended, which is basically what UTF-8 is. Um, but UTF-8 is the single byte representation that's dominant in all uh, in all English language encoding models of of text. And how does it work? It's it's actually quite simple, right? You see this string of seven numbers, of seven zeros and ones. This is the binary ones and zeros that we know about. And there's just a letter next to it. There's capital letters and lowercase letters, and there's numbers over here. So the binary seven digits that correspond to the decimal number value 114 is lowercase f. That's how it works. And uppercase g or uppercase a is number 65. That's it, the binary sequence of seven digits that represents 65. That's all you have. There's really nothing else. It's not more complicated than that. Now we're showing eight zeros and ones here, right? Because it's always nice to show things in bytes, but you'll notice this only goes up to a bunch of sequential seven ones. Why? Because the people that designed ASCII back in the day were trying to be conservative and save space and figured, hey, we can save one bit and still fit in all the uppercase, all the lowercase, all the numbers, all of the common characters we understand, and have a bunch left over for some control sequences. So let's just smush them all together into a seven bit representation. And that means every, every eight letters, we get one for free because we've saved that extra bit. That's back in the day when storage was extremely expensive and each individual bit was something to consider. We don't care anymore. We bits are bits and bytes are very, very cheap uh, on the grand scheme of things. Text encoding is not very complicated, right? It's cheap now. Very, very, we have, we have gigabytes and terabytes available. So, you know, individual bytes don't matter so much for your text documents. They, they come for free. But this is it. It's just a lookup table. And it's really nothing more than that. And just sequences of these zeros and ones grouped together eight at a time or seven at a time back in the day would be how you would spell words out. So if you wanted to say hi in capital H and lowercase i, you would go in here, set this sequence of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then next to it, you would go over here, find the I, and put out its sequence, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and those 16 bits together would, would encode the word hi, capital H, lowercase i. And you can use any other combination you want to spell out pretty much anything else, and you just keep tacking on more and more sequences of eight or seven, depending on how you're encoding it, um, to uh, represent any text, any sentence, any word, any paragraph, any book that you want to encode. Now you might be saying, okay, this is cool, but there are other languages in the world beside English. 
how is any of that dealt with? And that's a very good observation. Up until uh, up until Unicode, which is why it's Unicode is unified encodings, right? That's sort of what it, what it, uh, what's the what it what it's um, what it's trying to represent. Um, Unicode is, is what is sort of the two words that it's sort of putting together. Um, every single language had its own representation and its own table to represent its characters with, and you had to know what language you were dealing with in order to switch between them. Unicode blew that out of the water and said, no, this is too messy. This is crazy. We just got to fix this. And so they standardized on a, 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 a set of encodings that just used more bytes to get you more space, to get you more letters. And so while UTF-8 is still basically backwards compatible with ASCII because it was you know the, the most popular and, and most common commonly used and because most of computing came out of the US, um, they switched, they, they grew these models, and there's also something called UTF-16, which is a two-byte encoding model for, for text. And this includes many, many more options, right? Instead of having only 256 total choices, of which only 128 are shown here, there's now 16 bits of information to represent all the characters. And so you've got 65,000 something odd different unique symbols in your lookup table now. That gave you a lot more languages you could represent. There's even all the way out to UTF-32, which is a four byte representation, four byte encoding model for characters. This is huge, right? Four bytes is an insane amount of information. Two to the 32 is 4.3 billion something, right? Almost 4.3 billion. And, and that's a tremendously large lookup table for you to encode it. It's so large that you can fit every single language and give it a unique, a unique character, a unique 32-bit string uh, sequence for every single character in that language. And so UTF-32 just sort of takes care of everything. If you're willing to represent and give up four bytes for every letter you want to represent, you can take care of every language in the world. Not only can you take care of every language, you got so much extra space. That there's actually a group, a Unicode consortium that comes together and decides what to do with some of that extra space. What do you think they've done with most of that extra space? Well, this is where all the emojis come from. Emojis are actually the result of Unicode consortium agreements on how to encode some of these empty, unused spaces. I mean, the vast majority of it is empty and unused. And every time you might hear, oh, some new emojis have come out. Well, it's because the Unicode consortium has agreed upon allocating new strings, uh, un previously unused sequences of 32 bits of information to encode a different smiley or to encode uh, a plane or a heart or a new animal or whatever they're trying to put into the into the into the into the emoji system that's why it doesn't matter what computer you're on what phone you're on what make or model it is as long as they understand how to decode Unico uh, UTF32 you can send right your little heart shaped poop shaped whatever emoji and the other person's going to get it cuz they're all working on the same UTF32 encoding character scheme that's how it works. This is by far the most common way of, of encoding text in, in computers. UTF is pretty international and works across many, many encoding schemes. And then for being a little more efficient, uh, folks will often turn to UTF-8.